you don't need to hire a web design company and pay $100,000 to have a really nice website now. Business of Architecture, episode 365. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. This podcast is sponsored and produced by Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy for architects that helps firm owners structure their practice and their teams for freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Today, I have the honor to speak with Paul Petrunia, who's the founder of Arconnect. Launched in 1997, Arconnect.com is the most established online architecture community and content source for the architecture and design community. Tens of thousands of architects, students, and fans browse the site daily for the latest jobs, news headlines, competition, and event listings, featured editorials, and active discussions. And if you're listening to this podcast, my guess is that you're very familiar with Arconnect. You've probably browsed it. You may have even looked for a job on Arconnect. It's a great place to find jobs and to post jobs. Today, we get to go behind the scenes of Arconnect with Paul Petrunia. You'll discover how Paul launched and built Arconnect over the years to what it is today. Paul, welcome to the business of architecture. Thanks, Enoch. It's great, great being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely great having you here. I've been, you know, I remember back when I was in school in Cornell, Arconnect was just the cool place to be. And I used to spend I used to spend a decent amount of time there, you know, kind of browsing the threads, the forums, and getting to know some of the people on there. You have your diehards that were on there all the time. You know, it was interesting, you know, some people might be considered, there was always the outspoken, very kind of like passionate people putting their 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 ideas out there. But I know Arconnect existed before that. So I'd like to ask you, what's what's the origin story? Tell us a little bit about the man behind this um, this forum that's so beloved and very present in our industry. Um, so I guess it goes back, it goes back a long time, you know, Arconnect is now in, in our, um, 24th year. What year did uh, it, know, we, did it officially I, launch? It officially launched in 1997. Okay. Um, but I guess the seeds of Arconnect were planted years before that, um, when I was, uh, when I was a high school student, you know, I had wanted to be an architect since I was 10 years old. Um, when I was in high school, I really started thinking about pursuing architecture school. And I was especially passionate about contemporary architecture. Um, and back then in the 90s, you know, I was gr growing up in Victoria, British Columbia. It's not a huge metropolis. You know, it's a relatively sleepy little island town in Canada. Um, and there was no way for me to really access what was going on in the contemporary architecture scene. You know, I was, I was, I was amazed at how, how much of a, a wall or a boundary was around that, that whole world and how kind of incestuous that world was. They really didn't kind of, uh, contemporary architects didn't really get the kind of exposure that people are familiar with getting today. So, you know, I, I found myself jumping on my bike and riding my bike to the, to the University of Victoria library where I could get copies of, uh, you know, A plus U and architectural record and, uh, and PA, which no longer exists. Um, and all these monographs, which were not really even available at the local library. And it opened up my world to this whole exciting, uh, scene and, um, you know, of, of contemporary architecture all over the world, especially, you know, actually in British Columbia as well. And that once I started doing this research, I, I actually put together a calendar when I was in high school of the most exciting contemporary architects in British Columbia. And there's there are so many. And for some reason in Canada, a lot of the most interesting architects kind of fly under the radar. It's not um, they don't generally get as much exposure as they do in the US or or elsewhere, you know, Europe, um, especially these days. But anyway, so I started putting together this calendar back then, you know, the the process of doing this was literally going to the, the library looking through uh, copies of yellow pages from around the around the province and faxing these offices, my request for 
uh, photographs of their work and a little description of, of, you know, of their work and, and their, and their practice. And I turned it into a calendar. You know, I, I received a lot of excited responses. I think people thought it was probably pretty cute that, <laughs> you know, that a kid was, was, uh, expressing interest in their work. Um, so, so that kind of planted my seeds, uh, planted the seed for my, my desire to, to kind of get the word out about the exciting work that was happening in architecture. So when um, when I started architecture school, I began architecture school at the University of Oregon. Okay, can and... I pause you right there, Paul, in this story? Sure. Because yeah. I want to follow up on that. That was it's very interesting that you were so dialed into contemporary architecture at such a young age. Because I know in my in my experience when I was getting ready to go to architecture school, I was also fascinated by the idea of architecture, the idea of designing and all the what I, what I, my image of what I thought it was, but I was far from sophisticated in terms of my tastes of architecture and knowing what was really out there. As a matter of fact, I remember for, and we, so we had to get interviewed by an alumnus as part of our application. And so I had to, uh, you know, I knew they were going to ask about sort of my favorite architects during the interview. So I literally went down to the bookstore and I looked for some flashy architecture books and uh, one that jumped out was a, it was a monograph by I.M. Pei. And so I went and I said, I.M. Pei is my favorite architect because I, I wanted something beyond a Frank Lloyd Wright, you know? Yeah, And yeah. Um, so I was very, very ignorant of the, the kind of things that I learned later in school and college. But it sounds like you were, uh, sounds like you were pretty advanced in terms of understanding and appreciation for, for contemporary architecture. Well, that was really, that, that's really what I was passionate about. And I think that came from, you know, my, my mom was an interior designer and she flipped houses. So what, when I was really young, I would just follow her to these houses and I kind of got an inside look into, um, how people were, how people were transforming their space through renovations from, you know, a, a, a fixer upper into a really stunning, um, residence. I also had the, the, the good fortune of being able to travel a lot when I was young. So I did, uh, you know, really, I think maybe subconsciously ab absorbed the, the different types of architecture from around the world and some cities more so than, than in where I grew up really had the, the most exciting new architecture more on public display. I found in Canada, it was more about the private, the private, uh, <clears throat> developer that was doing the most interesting stuff, a lot of residential work. So it, it drove my curiosity to finding out who was doing this work, you know, and, and, and it, it became a little bit of an obsession. You know, by the time I started architecture school, I feel like I knew more about what, <laughs> what the contemporary architecture scene was even more so than I do now, because I was just so obsessed with, with, uh, with with the work of of new architects that's you know, nice. so that, that's really interesting <clears throat> it was self driven and that and that self uh that self kind of self disciplined research is what led me to creating Archonnect because when i was at the university of oregon right away i i uh the university of oregon was pretty tech forward there were a few people at the time in in 95 which is kind of surprising because the the reason i went there was because of their their focus on sustainable design, which I was also very passionate about, but you know, you don't usually, you know, combine, um, or relate sustainability with really kind of, uh, forward thinking technology, but there were a lot of, uh, forward thinking technologists at the school that were pushing for, <clears throat> um, exploring web design. So I, I taught myself how to design websites, you know, by looking at source code, I started designing, uh, websites for the school of architecture and allied arts at the university of Oregon. Um, and as soon as I started doing that, I, I kind of connected the dots and, and realized like this, this new medium, which most people were not on at that time, back in 95, um, would, is the medium that, that I need to kind of get this information out there and create a platform where people can share their information. So, so one summer, the summer of, of 97, I, you know, my, my parents, you know, joke about this a lot, but I came home from architecture school and I pretty much locked myself in my bedroom for the whole summer, just creating the website. Um, and it was, 
it was done and and um it was done by the fall <clears throat> and actually in that fall i transitioned i transferred from the university of oregon to sciarc because i was uh i had already finished two years at, at the university of oregon really enjoyed the program great program but i felt like i got enough knowledge about sustainable design and i wanted to kind of do a 360 and really explore something much more kind of uh a more self-driven curriculum that was kind of a more alternative uh, perspective on architecture so i started sciarc <clears throat> and i feel like i really kind of lucked out at sciarc because i was in an environment where there was so much exciting work going on you know from both the faculty some of my favorite architects were the faculty at the time and the students were doing incredible work and i could not believe the kind of work that i saw when i first started at sciarc in these final reviews i was completely blown away completely new to me because not only was it not found outside of academia but it, this w work was not being published architecture magazines were not publishing student work so i used that opportunity to start featuring my fellow classmates work and it became it quickly became very popular at sciarc and then it started kind of reaching out into UCLA and USC and, and you know through friends and it, it it really was so the success of of Arconnect was kind of born out of the world of academia yeah and that makes sense and uh, I was looking at it back in so I started Cornell and well it was 1998 when I started and so that yeah it had been going for a couple years now Obviously, it's morphed a lot since those early days of what it originally was. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what was it initially that, that caused it to grow? Where did you find that the growth happened? Well, it was, it, was an, it was a combination of a few different things. You know, I was really at the right, right place at the right time. Um, so i very lucky in that regard. Um, the fact that nothing existed back then there was no there were no websites where you could see what you know other young architects or students were working on you know there was no way of finding out what people in other schools were doing um, without talking to them directly so immediately it it uh it fed people's curiosity in the industry about um what was happening outside of their own sphere there was also, I also, um, I took on this, this project early on. I think I started this in 1998 because I was also very engaged in the, in this web design community back in the, in the, in the nineties that was an incredibly exciting time. And I'm, I'm actually amazed that nobody has really fully documented this, this time in history where young designers were popping up all over the world these kids creating amazing interactive design work using this new medium of the internet so i became very engaged in that community i i, I formed a lot of friendships among web designers that were completely uh, had nothing to do with architecture but they were they loved architecture a lot of these web designers explored 3d design in their in their graphic design and interactive design so i started inviting some of my favorite designers to create uh splash pages because back then splash pages were you know were were a respectable thing they were cool uh, so each month for a few years i had a different amazingly talented web designer create a splash page that would be a splash page just for Arconnect for that one month and that gained a lot of traction outside of the architecture industry so which was really my goal it started connecting people from other other industries with architects you know and it started expanding the scope of of influence and inspiration um for you know my fellow my fellow architects um and colleagues uh, classmates at the time so that that really widened the net a lot widened the audience um and then i and then i took that that wider audience and i incorporated a discussion community a discussion forum at first it started out with scheduled 
um, live chats with where I would invite a a well-known figure in design or architecture to to kind of almost like an early Reddit AMA, like ask me anything kind of uh, environment where architects could log on, talk. It was a complete, it was a, it was total mayhem because literally thousands of people were on this Java app, uh, web browser app, and there was no way of moderating, you know, so it was just a ton of people asking questions and talking and kind of going off on tangents. There was no technology back then to manage that kind of, that kind of, uh, uh, audience size. So so I then uh, worked with a friend of mine to develop a uh, a discussion forum, which, you know, has changed a lot from a technical perspective over the years, but hasn't really, you know, from from uh, from the user's perspective, hasn't changed that much uh, to to what it is today. Yeah. But there has been, um, you know, it obviously the site and the discussion forum has evolved as social media has has infiltrated everybody's world you know back then when we first created the discussion forum on Arcnect, it was the one and only place where you could talk to other architects from other parts of the world unless you wanted to get into you know some kind of bulletin board system that that you know the all the the, the really tech savvy people had been doing for years b- before that but uh, you've been throwing around some great terms that are bringing back a lot of memories for me uh, for instance, bulletin board systems, I remember in the school that I grew up in, my high school, it was back in the, the late 80s, early 90s. And they, you know, I would log into Telnet, we would dial up the local bulletin board system, total text interface. And I mean, those were, <laughs> those were fun days. I know. I, I, I tell my kids, you know, my, my first email address was ppetrunia at gladstone.darkwing.universityoforegon.edu. And I would have to access my, my email through, through Telnet and through some kind of DOS-based interface that, you know, required probably a, a hundred different keyboard clicks before you could even see what was in your inbox. Yeah. So after school, so you went to SciArc. Did you graduate from SciArc? And what was your first your first job, shall we say, or did you get a job directly thereafter? What happened then? Well, so I I transferred to SciArc, and um, in my last year before thesis, I, I loved SciArc. I, I it was really the the most amazing environment that I could imagine at the time. It was just such a creative environment. But in, in 1999, that was kind of when the dot-com bubble, the first dot-com bubble started emerging. And I was a student. I, ha- I was getting, you know, absolutely drowning in student loans. And I started getting these amazing job offers from, from tech companies that were just trying to snatch up any young talent. Um, so I, I thought to myself, like, you know, maybe I should just take a year off, pay off my student loans get some exciting experience in this in this new industry and that quickly morphed into this idea that I had with four other friends of mine who were all graduating from the graduate program at the time actually three other friends there were four of us to just start our own com- uh, company so we started so I I took a uh, I took what was going to be what was planned at the time to be a year off to to start this company the company was called low country guidance and we designed we designed everything we designed furniture for uh, cindy crawford the model we designed skateboard uh, trucks for you know the skateboard companies we designed motion graphics for the travel channel and discovery channel we did architecture you know we did we designed custom stereo cabinets made out of you know uh, refrigerator technology for people that lived on the beach it was all kinds of really cool stuff uh money was flowing back then because people were just wanting to so it was great you know it was uh it was a lot of fun but it was for recent architecture grads with a lot of creative energy and absolutely no business knowledge or experience so it was a lot of you know like big paychecks and just reckless spending going broke it was it was it, it was just a, a few years of fluctuating between feeling rich and broke um and so two years after we had we had launched that 
um, we were getting more and more requests for web design and I was kind of the web guy in the office. And, um, so I decided I was, I would start a, a, another company called extra medium, which just did web design. And it was, and, and that company, we, we, uh, catered almost exclusively to the architecture industry. We did work with people in, um, some companies in the entertainment industry and, other types of industries, but it was mostly websites for architecture schools and um, architecture firms around the country. So we did that for um, until 2004 when I, and during this time, during the time that I, that I was running Low Country Guidance and Extra Medium, I was doing Archonnect on the nights and weekends, any time I had. That was, that was always where my passion was. And in, and around 2004, up until then, I was actually turning down offers for advertising money. I, I didn't want Arconnect to be a business because I just, you know, I was like, I already have a business. I don't have time for another business right now. Um, so I was turning it down. I didn't, I didn't want that. But then in 2004, I realized like, you know, this is really what I'm most passionate about. And... I got to just give this a try. So I started accepting these, these, you know, advertising offers and, and, um, exploring other revenue channels. And that just quickly became my, my full-time business. So I, you know, I had to break the news to my clients that we were going to have to cease, uh, working with them. Um, and yeah, and I just refocused all my energy into Arconnect and that's, that's where it's been ever since. In the early days of Arconnect, before that 2004 time frame, when you were first starting it out, was it just you doing everything or were you able to start to get collaborators in other places who would help out and help moderate and, and be part of what you were doing? Yeah, well, so I guess there's different ways of looking at it. You know, back then, up, up until 2011, I did, I, I was doing all of the programming you know, all of the back end programming, the front end programming, all of the design, um, all of the, you know, communications. But we, uh, uh, but we created, we kind of uh, developed a large network of contributors that would, that just, you know, that, that I worked with to, to put together essays, articles, profiles, interviews. And that was just kind of a constantly um, fluctuating network of friends that, or people that became my friends. Um, and it was, there was no business strategy, you know, behind that. Nobody was being paid. Um, it was kind of like, uh, here's a platform to do what you want. And um, I wasn't getting paid. So I, I mean, I, the, the site wasn't, wasn't making money. Uh, so um, but it, it was, it was a really interesting time because it that, that also extended our reach through these, uh, through this diversity of uh, voices that, that were incorporated into the site over time. And they, it was, it was an incredible mix of very, very smart people that I have always respected quite a lot. Tell me how you decided to monetize Arconnect. What was the first monetization strategy and what was the second? Well, the first monetization strategy was literally, well, actually, I, you know, to be honest, I have to go way back to the very beginning because when I first was starting Arconnect, I, I did in the very beginning, I wanted it to make some money to be able to just, you know, uh, justify the time and everything. So the idea from the beginning was to, to kind of, um, create an op opportunities for people to host their profiles on for both firms and people to host their profiles and they would pay to host their profiles you know back then i didn't realize that the future would be filled with we with websites where anybody can host a profile anywhere and you don't have to pay for but that you were just you so just ahead of the curve of I mean, that was, that's that's pretty remarkable to back then uh, you know kind of coming up with the early version of what we're so what's so common nowadays well, you know, when you look, when you really kind of look at what is the most successful right now in any industry, especially the internet, it's all simple ideas. You don't have to think about, think it too hard, you know, like it's, it's, uh, it's ideas that, you know, Twitter, very simple idea. Um, 
Facebook started out as a very simple idea, uh, you know, Flickr, which is not that relevant anymore. You know, it's just it's simple ideas that people just looking at what people need and what people want. Um, you know, I think a lot of people overthink their business strategy these days. Uh, so like, I mean, with Clubhouse, for example, have you been on Clubhouse? I've I mean, it's my just toe, such I've a, dipped my toe in the water. Yeah, it's such a simple concept, um, but it doesn't need to be anything more complicated than that. So so anyways, going back to that, I, I quickly realized that I couldn't I couldn't talk anybody into paying five dollars a month to host their their profile because nobody even really knew what the Internet offered back then. It was it was pretty crazy. Like in the in the 90s, very few people were online. So anyway, so then I just scrapped that. I was like, I'm just doing this for fun. So then when uh, 2004 came along, I started taking I started working with advertisers to uh, on campaigns to promote their products. I mean, it really ranged from schools to we worked with Scion, the car company. We worked with uh, lots, lots of companies that started realizing like the Internet is where we need to be moving our advertising because back then, especially it was way cheaper and they were starting to realize that it was more effective. And all of a sudden, architect, you know, anybody catering to the architecture industry had a market right there that was highly targeted. Um, so started doing that. We, um, I created the job board in 2004. Um, and that, that took off pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, and that was, that was really, you know, how it started. And, and we've kind of been focused on those areas, uh, since. Paul, so what's next? Where do you see with your, you've been in the internet, this online digital space since the very early days, and you've seen a lot, uh, both from the architecture side and the digital side, without revealing any trade secrets, what's next for Arconnect? Where do you see this going and, and the industry in general? Well, you know, it's, uh, I guess when I, when I look at at where it's going, I also have to look back at how I've evolved it. You know, when I say that the last thing I said may come across like we've just done the same thing that we've been doing, you know, since 2004, but the web is an incredibly, the internet is a very quickly evolving medium and you need to keep up and you need to always be thinking about what people are going to be needing in a year or two, um, and you need to start planning for that. Um, I, you know, our connect is, uh, has been around for longer than, um, almost any other website that I can think of. Um, and, and I credit that to ha to always being willing to evolve and, and part of, part of being able and willing to evolve is that I've remained, uh, independent, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, there have been a lot of, a lot of acquisition offers over the years. There's been a lot of interest in investment. And, you know, while I'm always open to hearing proposals, uh, unless the fit is 100% aligned with, with how I envision, um, the business in the, you know, in the present day and in the future, it's just not something that I see as a sustainable option. Um, that said, I'm, you know, I, I remain open to those possibilities, but, uh, given the, so in, in terms of your question about how I see it moving forward, um, we're currently working on a number of new features. Uh, redesign is, is way overdue that, and that's currently, um, being developed. It has to be tread, treaded very lightly with, in terms of, in terms of, uh, redesigns. I've seen so many successful online businesses redesign their platforms in a very professional and good way to see to to, to only see the the uh the business fail or or uh struggle as a result because people become very familiar with with uh a certain way of interacting you know with with a website or with other users on a website and once you start changing that it it can be easy to lose people. So, um, we're, we're working on those changes. We're working on, um, improving a number of features in our talent finder service, which is a, uh, 
which is a subscription service that we have on the site that allows employers to browse. I think right now we're at a little over 40,000 job, job seekers that are looking for work. Um, there's a lot of ways to improve the, the, uh, the experience for both employers and, and job seekers in that area. Um, what else? You know, for the for for the last few years, every year I've taken on a different experiment. Um, the first experiment was actually our podcast in 2016, um, which is still going, uh, even though it's it's uh, we're we're on a hiatus right now. Um, the after that, we started a, a print publication called um, Ed, which uh, we we've released a number of of uh, issues wanted to explore. It was, I, I got to a point in my career where I was like, you know, the same feelings I had back in the nineties where I felt like the internet provided something new in 2017, I kind of felt that way about print again, even though print is as old as, as you, I mean, it's in, it's probably one of the oldest medium mediums that you can, uh, out there, but I felt like it was time to take a look back at print and and how we can incorporate that into this new way of consuming content in a, in a different way. So we did that as an experiment. The next year after that, I start I opened up a, a an event space and in, in shop in downtown Los Angeles. And then the year after that in 2019, we started a coffee a coffee brand called Brutal, uh you know, architecturally inspired uh, inspired coffee brand. Um which is just kind of a, a passion project for myself because I love coffee and I love really good, well-roasted coffee. That's highly, you know, it's all single origin. Uh, you know, I work with, uh, an amazing roaster here in Los Angeles. Um, so these have been little experiments that, that I've been trying with Arconnect every year to, as, as almost a way of marketing Arconnect, um, expanding our reach and also just having some fun. Uh, I think it's a lot more exciting to make a magazine, to make a print magazine than it is to advertise in a traditional sense. Print magazine is advertising. Um, and it also is uh, really great content. So, um, so I plan on still continuing to do these types of experiments, uh, moving forward. But, um, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to say I'm, I, whenever I'm asked about what, what I will be doing in the near and distant future. I'm always hesitant to give very specific answers because I don't want to jinx myself. I get it. I get it. I understand. From your perspective, what are your thoughts on what architects are doing now, just in terms of their online presence or their, I'm sure you have a very interesting perspective being in the role you're in right now about how you view the industry. What are some of your, your top thoughts sitting from where you sit looking at the state and the nature of everything architects do from how they design, how they run their businesses, how they present themselves, how they interact with the web. Well, I can kind of tie that back into, um, your previous question about, uh, about plans, uh, what's next. Um, the, so part of the reason why I really focused on creating websites for architects back in the, in the early knots was because the uh, architects had notoriously bad websites. And I feel like that started to change in the last few years. And part of that is because, uh, you know, the realization that, that the internet is very important in, in the way that you present yourself publicly. Um, and also there have been, there are so many websites out there that are beautiful websites that are created on Squarespace or Wix. You know, you don't need to hire a web design company and pay a hundred thousand dollars to have a really nice website now. So the, the way that architects have been presenting themselves online through their own websites has, in, has improved dramatically. There's still a lot of dogs out there in terms of web, uh, websites for architects. Um, architects have engaged in social media in, in uh, many interesting ways, many architects have have incorporated that much better than others. Uh, you know, Bjarke Ingels, for example, has incorporated a lot of his own personal life into his social media presence, which I think is appropriate for his practice because it's so driven by his own kind of uh, persona that is uh, that draws a lot of people to their work. Um, 
Instagram has been a surprisingly influential social network for architects because of its visual nature. From from my unique perspective in 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 how I work, I've been noticing that firms are getting better at submitting press releases and new projects to to publications. You know, I think they're realizing now that there's a certain way to package content that will that will actually get reviewed and and well received by by publications. So going back to what what's next, something that's been on my plate for a long time, which I which I do plan on on finally starting in in 2021, is creating a column on Archonnect that is is uh, reviewing websites um, by architecture firms because there's a lot of there's a lot of do's and don'ts that I've come across in in my years of of looking at architecture websites um, that architects are still guilty of of the don'ts regardless of how, how good their website looks. Yeah. I mean, does that, does that answer the question? I, yeah. I got a little off tra- off topic. Kind so of. Paul, you're, you're the, the founder and the face behind Archonnect, one of the longest standing architecturally focused websites in the industry. And you mentioned the do's and don'ts of architects websites. What would you say are the top do's and don'ts that you can share with us right now? Um, understanding your, your target audience, you know, some, uh, what a lot of architects don't realize is that their websites are being, in addition to, uh, in addition to selling themselves to potential clients, their websites are being visited by a lot of people interested in working for them. So if you want to attract the best client or the best, the best talent, you need to provide some more information about your your office culture, your work culture, your your values to appeal to that that demographic. Another another mistake that I notice often is is just forgetting why people are coming to your website. You know, with with websites now like House and Yelp um, and and Archonnect also, a lot of people just want to get some information, like a phone number from from an architect's uh, website uh, just to contact them or they want to be able to quickly browse their work. I can't I can't believe how many architects websites now you go to and instead of there being an easy to navigate portfolio section, there's a list of a hundred project titles and you have to go and you have to click a project title to view that project. You don't even know you, you might start loading you know 10 megabytes of, of images. And you realize within the first few seconds, I'm not interested in that project. And then you give up because you, you, it, there's no way to present kind of a good visual overview of their work. Um, accessibility. You know, these days, uh, every year, more and more people are accessing websites from mobile devices. So if your website doesn't look good or is hard to use on a mobile device, you're going to be losing uh, a lot of people. I would say that those are the, I guess, the first don'ts that come to mind. Got it. Well, thanks, Paul. So in, in this conversation, I'm just curious, one last question for you, and that is, sure. what, question, what question do you wish that I would have asked that I didn't? You know, it's funny. Every time I hear somebody say, that's a great question, I always cringe a little bit because uh, <laughs> it's just such a typical response. Uh, but that is a good question. I, I have to give you credit for that. Um, you know, I'm... To be honest, I have some ideas in mind, and I'm glad you didn't ask them to me <laughs> because uh, because there are questions that would have been um, that would have been a challenge to answer. I think you I think you kind of covered all the bases. Yeah, I'm sorry I can't give you a good answer on that. Okay, very very evasive, like a good politician, <laughs> Paul. That's great. Oh no, <laughs> that's the worst. Uh, that's the worst thing I've ever uh, somebody's ever told me. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Well, at least I at just, least I went down I'm in just your joking. book somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, we're, we're our uh, our podcast is going to be coming out of hiatus soon, and I would love to have you on the show and and learn about about your work more and share your work with our audience because. You know, I've uh, actually recently spoke to my staff about this podcast and, and one of my employees was like, oh, yeah, the firm that I was at last, uh, Enoch came to consult at our firm. And it, it was such an amazing experience. Everybody really loved it. Oh, wow. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about what what that what that uh, 
that was that you that you came in and uh, offered them and spoke yeah. to them about. I'm tickled. That, that's really that's really great to hear. I'd love to come on the show. Uh, and for those of who are listening, go check out Arconnect sessions. Tell them where would you direct them to go find out more about both Arconnect and the podcast. Well, you can get it at all of the you know places you listen to podcasts, um, or you can go to Arconnect sessions or Arconnect.com slash sessions for kind of a list of all of the the episodes that we've released. Um, yeah, I mean, by the time you air this, we might have a new one because we are working with, uh, with an event, uh, that we're kind of collaborating with uh, on some, some interviews in the, in the next week or two. Um, but yeah, love to, to get more people listening to the show. Fantastic. You know, architecture is a, is a highly kind of niche corner of the podcasting world. So it's uh, it's great to be able to. I mean, that's the great thing about podcasting. You can talk about anything and have an audience. Um, yeah, yeah, it really is. I'm going to throw out something here for our listeners that just crossed my mind. I would like to know when do you listen to podcasts? So when you're, whether you're listening to Our Connect Sessions or the Business of Architecture podcast or any other podcast, do you do it while you're drafting? Do you do it while you're designing? Because I find that I can't listen to content while I'm drafting unless it's very, very mindless repetition work, but because I need to focus on that, do you do it when you're jogging? So shout us out, either one of us, hit us up on social media, let us know, where do you listen to the podcast? Send me an email, enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. Love to know that. Paul, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Enoch. It was a pleasure. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.